Dr. Chekcharya Udar Didi. He's from MCAD. He's the business development director. Uh, he has more than 16 years of experience in device and circuit characterization. And his interests are and expertise are in load pole noise measurement, circuit characterization, and modeling. He has offer, authored several papers in journals and conferences. Uh, so today he will be talking about uh, RF load pole measurements, which is an important uh, measurement technique for, especially for circuits, uh, RF circuits, uh, active circuits. So Jack, please. Thank you, Yogesh. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna start by sharing my uh, screen. Um, Yogesh, can you please allow me to share the screen or are you going to? Uh, yeah, please, please, now it, now it should be. Okay, thanks. All right, so I'm gonna share this screen here. Uh, let me know if you see it. Yes. Perfect. So uh, welcome everybody. So welcome to this journey into uh, device uh, characterization and circuit characterization. Uh, we will take it uh, step by step and I guess uh, some questions we raise and uh, you can uh, write them down or keep them until the end. Uh, I guess it's better in this uh, type of uh, uh, gathering, a virtual gathering. So it's better to have these questions at the end. <clears throat> All right. So. Uh, Okay, let me start here. Perfect. So the idea is uh, we will go through the uh, device characterization. So our mission is actually to uh, shorten and uh, secure the RF and microwave design flow. So we start from the components and as a company we would like to uh, provide the measurement conditions and the measurement instruments uh, capable to get you all the information and all the measurements needed to, for example, have a model. And from the model that is at the com at the component level, uh, we would like to help designers design their circuit. And from the circuit, we'd like to help the system architecture designers uh, do their uh, integration uh, the fastest possible. So the idea here is to shorten this cycle and in the industry time is money so the the, the better we can shorten this uh this cycle the, the 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 first you are in the market and the better you can uh be to propose a solution to your customers as well so this is a very important aspect so from the component levels uh of course, we uh, we start by the pulse ID and pulse S parameters or pulse F RF measurements, and this is in order to extract a compact model. Following the compact model, you need a load pool system to be able to validate that uh, model and to refine the model as well. And finally, uh, you can do the analysis, the stability analysis of the design because uh, believe it or not, uh, amplifiers don't work the first time. They are uh, prone to oscillation and instabilities. So you need a tool for that to, to be able to get your design sorted out. And this is uh, proposed <coughs> in the software called IVCAD. And the idea here is to have accurate measurements and model so you can go through these steps. So let's start with, with the uh, device uh, modeling uh, and we'll go through the standard extraction flow and the validation. So as you know, uh, we have the schematic model here of uh, a device. So we have the extrinsic, uh, oops, yeah, I'm going a little bit too fast. Sorry about that. So we have the extrinsic elements, uh, the input diodes, the nonlinear capacitance, uh, we have the uh, original uh, current source, the breakdown source as well, and of course the thermal uh, circuit to, to be able to uh, validate and to extract the model, taking into account the thermal effects. Now, in terms of hardware, so you need to be able to extract this model 
but first you need to do some measurements. So the first thing is we need to do measurements with a very short pulse. And the reason for that is we would like to have quasi isothermal conditions. We would like also to do the measurement with a very low duty cycle. And the reason for that is to have a constant mean temperature. All right. Now, being also able to uh, do the measurement from different quiescent uh, bias points, this will help actually fix the thermal conditions and the trapped conditions in the device. And as we will see, those are very important uh, parameters. So having the right tools uh, will help you actually uh, do measurement on high, uh, high power dissipated area and having safe operating conditions. You will be able to take into account thermal effects, dropping effects, and at the end have uh, precision modeling data. Now, very important in terms of instruments, uh, if, if you have to invest in instruments, instruments are very important. You, you don't cut the corners in instruments. Uh, don't try to, uh, to get a DNA that, for example, does not have pulse conditions and try to do S parameters, not in pulse, and try to get a model. That will not give you the right uh, answers. So investing in the right instrument is your first step to get a good model. Now, the model extraction uh, flow, we start with the small signal, the ID model, the nonlinear capacitance, the thermal model, and then the trapping effect. So we try to go, I know we have a lot of uh, information to, to pass you guys. So we will probably go a little bit fast on each uh, point. But again, if you have any question, don't hesitate. So the first uh, first thing to, to do is to extract the small, small signal uh, parameters. And as you know, we have, uh, if we take the schematic of a, a device, we have the external or the extrinsic parameters like the pad capacitance, the port metallization, and the uh, uh, ohmic resistance. And we have also the intrinsic parameters that are shown here, which are the uh, channel capacitance, the uh, control source, uh, the ohmic resistance RI and RGB, and the output capacitance and RDS. So the idea here is we want to set the, uh, the boundaries of the ex, uh, extrinsic parameters. So how do we choose these extrinsic parameters? In the beginning, we use what we call the cold fed uh, measurements. The cold fed measurements actually are putting the uh, device in such condition that we can uh, eliminate uh, components. Uh, in one case, we eliminate the, uh, the the inductance and the other case we eliminate the uh, capacitance and with that we are able from the s parameter to get the initial point of lg rg cpg rd lg and cpg and the uh, of course rs and ls as well so the point here is we have these parameters that are given when we are in cold fat method uh, or when we do the cold fat measurement and these parameters can be used after that to extract the intrinsic. Now, however, when we, if we want to be in exactly the, the right cold fat conditions, uh, we may actually uh, break the device. Okay, so one does not want to start by breaking the device, which is this is the first measurement you will be doing, and you're going to break your device. So, nah, uh, we try not to do that. So, in that matter, what we do is we get ourselves close to these conditions. And then that gives us actually a first nominal point, which is not exactly what we uh, we are looking for, but at least it's a starting point. And from that starting point, we can set conditions or you can set minimum and maximum, and then we can optimize the algorithm. And this algorithm actually is quite simple, is for each set of extrinsic parameters, the intrinsic parameter that we calculate from there should actually be uh, frequency independent. So what we do is we launch this kind of algorithm where we change the extrinsic, we calculate the intrinsic, and we verify 
if we have that condition if yes then we found the right ex uh, intrinsic and extrinsic if not then we just change a little bit the extrinsic and redo our calculation so that's for the uh, small signal then the next step is actually the, uh, uh, the the current sources so the first one is the uh, the, the input diodes okay so for that, as we will be measuring, uh, as we will be measuring the uh, the gate in uh, forward conduction, we will have very very uh, low current that we will need to measure, and that's why we need to um, you need to have the right tool to be able to do that. So uh, Amca developed this uh, gate pulser uh, in the way that it has enough resolution in very low current to be able to measure this level of uh, variation of current and this is very important to extract the right mode then for the output current uh, the idea here is to be able to uh, take the the model with the with the measurements uh, sorry my slides have a timing and they go faster than i do <laughs> sorry about that so then the idea here is we want to measure the current, but again, it comes back also to the instruments where if you look at uh, the ID curves here, and if we zoom in, we can see that the current, very, very low current need also to be measured accurately. And this is what the system is capable of doing. And with that, we can extract the uh, GM, we can extract the VSS, we can extract the uh, the threshold and everything. So this is uh, very important in terms of measurement. Now for the capacitance, uh, AMCAD is a mostly, uh, uh, how can I say, they mostly do RF components. So for that, for RF applications, the, um, the, the model of the capacitance can be approximated to one dimension uh, capacitance extraction. And this is, for most of the cases, uh, they are uh, enough uh, because we try to extract the model close to the, uh, the load line, okay? So this is for the RF uh, conditions. However, if someone is looking to do uh, a model for a switch mode amplifier, where we will need to characterize the capacitor also in this region, then we're going to need to have a 2D or two dimension capacitance extraction. And for that, it's, uh, there are other equations that can be used to, to extract. And the reason why we, uh, we go with this approximation here, and that uh, in this region, we, we, we tend to have around 2% error. And the reason for that is if you look at VGS, for example, the variation of VGS is very minimal with the variation, of, uh, sorry, the variation of uh, CGD is very minimal with the variation of, uh, of VGS. And for the same reason also, uh, CGS, the variation of CGS tend to be uh, quite uh, constant with the variation of EDS. So that's why this uh, approximation of one dimension is enough. Now, uh, going back to the uh, to the source, we need to take into account the thermal conditions as well. So for that, what we do is we take our measurements in different at different chop temperature, uh, like in this case, minus forty twenty five hundred and fifty, and for uh, and also we take the measurements in static to be able to see the variation of the current with the temperature or the rotating of the device. And the important points we are looking for are actually the two values of tau one and tau two, which are the uh, time constant uh, for the, uh, when we apply the, the, the drain part, the drain voltage, okay? So we'd like to see the, this variation here and here, and also, the variation over time for the, uh, the, 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 con the time constant for the variation of the temperature of the device. 
Now, to be able to get this information, one needs to do uh, very long pulse measurements. And the reason why we need to do these very long pulse measurements is we would like to get the time constant to a steady state. So for example, this is a legacy PID uh, that AMCAD had uh, and the, in, in red and in green is the new PID system. So if you take a long pulse, you will see that the time const, uh, the, sorry, the temperature constant did not settle after 1.2 millisecond, but actually had to wait until one second before it settles. Okay, so that's why some to, to, to have a long pulse is very important to be able to extract accurately the, uh, the time constant here for the uh, temperature variation. Now, another aspect that is important on top of the thermal is uh, the trapping. So the trapping model actually is the charging and discharging of traps uh, has a very big influence. And we will see that later also when we will uh, be talking about power amplifiers and their applications in system integration and you see the, the direct uh, impact of this uh, trapping effect. And especially now in 5G uh, RF front end with massive MIMO uh, in, in time domain uh, deflecting, where actually we're using a time for up, uplink and time for downlink, well, the trap effect becomes very, very important. So here to characterize that, we're gonna be uh, actually highlighting the gate lag and the drain lag, and also looking for uh, the time constant for uh, to, to, to characterize these traps. So for gate lag and drain lag, we can, uh, easily see the, the, the effect of the gate lag and drain lag. So for example, uh, we see here between the uh, green, which is a, uh, an IV curve that was generated at, from bias or from a crescent of zero, zero. And then in red, we have uh, another IV curve that was generated with, uh, with a bias or crescent at VGS of minus four, and VGS equals zero. So you really see the effect of uh, the, uh, the current uh, actually collapsing here. And this is uh, the, the gate lag that we, uh, we can characterize. Uh, for the same uh, way, we can see uh, a drain lag, okay, uh, where we in red actually is, the, is, a, is a curve for minus three and zero. And the green, uh, the green curve is from minus three for VGS and 30 volts. So we can see here uh, the drain lag uh, effect where we are uh, uh, increasing the VME and all that. So for us to be able to characterize that, we need to see or to, uh, to uh, capture or to characterize actually the time for of capture and time of emission. And to be able to do that, we need to have uh, a long pulse, but as the trapping effect and the uh, thermal effect are quite uh, close to each other or correlated, we need to make sure that when we are characterizing the tra trapping effects, we are not exciting the thermal effects and vice versa. So for example, here uh, to uh, check uh, for the capture and emission time, what we do is we have a, a, a short pulse, but you see, at, you, you look at the level of the current is quite low. And the reason for that is we don't want to uh, excite the thermal effect. So we wanna keep the device very cool. VGS is constant and we pulse only VD. And by pulsing the VD, we can see that from the QSN we pulse, and then there is a uh, low shunt here. So we see that the QSN does not uh, go back to the IDP original, it goes lower, and then it does a recovery. And this recovery time is very important. That's what we are looking for. 
and we uh, we can see this recovery time actually going quite long. So having the capability to have a very long pulse here helps you find the condition at which you're going to have to send the pulses to be able to uh, extract parameters without exciting um, different effects. So, for example, if you want to send the pulse, but you are not, uh, but your pulse is not long enough, well, this phenomena will just build on itself. So actually you will have cumulative effect of this phenomena because your next pulse will start lower. It means that your IDQ will even go lower and then you will start the other one lower and so on. So actually this curve will look at something like this. And this is not something you can do because you will not be able to capture adequately all the parameters for your problem. Now, when you are, uh, working on a device and how these trap effects are actually uh, shown on, 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 uh, on the power characterization of this device at high power. Well, if you look at this curve here, we can see that uh, we have uh, a peaking, so to an uh, device. So we, we have the current go flowing or going up with the RF. At a certain time, the RF is so high that well, the, the drain, as we have a drain lag, the current does not go to the, uh, does, not, does not do the full excursion, okay? So in fact, there is a drain lag that will catch up eventually later, but during this time, your power will be lower and we, we will see it actually here. So in, when you do your measurements, in the beginning, you have a good current and then suddenly your currents are higher than uh, sorry, uh, yeah, your current are higher than uh, what you have in the model, okay? If, so if you don't do the, the traps, you will measure or you will get a current that is higher at low power and eventually it will catch up. And if you have a model that has the trap, well, you will have a better excursion or a better uh, fit in terms of power here, where you will see that you are getting exactly the output power that you are looking for. And this is something that we are look, uh, looking to characterize. Now, one thing that is important as uh, Professor Yogesh said before, is that you need to be able to characterize this device finally with notebook, because even if you extract a model, a compact model, you will need to validate that model against the uh, application. So usually, uh, and at MCAD, we do a lot of uh, modeling service for companies. And the first requirement is we would like to have a model for this quiescent conditions. And we need it for this class of operation, for this power, and for this frequency. So when we extract the model, the model usually is wide band, so it can work for different frequencies, but it needs to be refined for that frequency, for that bias, for that power. So and that's why you need actually to, uh, to use a load pool system. And what we use in a load pool system is mostly the time domain load pool system, because you need to have the information about the, uh, the, the dynamic load line, and you want to be able also to go to the intrinsic level and not stay at the extrinsic level uh, because your model is at the intrinsic, right? So as you have the extrinsic, the software will take this extrinsic and we embed everything to the duty reference plane or, or at the intrinsic reference plane. And to do this load pool, as we will see later, we need to optimize the input uh, tuner, but this is mostly to be able to drive the device with the power we need. And we need to show the impedances at F0, to F0, and 3F0 at the output of the device. So we are giving the, uh, the optimum load impedance to go to, 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 to synthesize actually the, or to be in the right class of operation with the right um, efficiency and the right output power. Now, as we said, we can do this uh, measurement in uh, uh, CW or in pulse, but the most important thing is we need to do this measurement in time domain. And for that, we need a phase reference because 
the signal that we will be injecting here is only at F0. The signal will be generating at the output of the DUT will be at F0, 2, F0, and 3, F0. So to be able to, uh, to get the uh, amplitude and phase, uh, the coherence of the amplitude and phase, especially the phase for the second and the third harmonic, we need the phase reference here. And with that, we'll be able to reconstruct the time do in time domain, the signal at the output. And the other way of doing load pool is instead of measuring or instead of uh, having a, a, quant a quantity of power, uh, some people would like to see it from the uh, dynamic load line excursion and try to play with that. And that's what we call the uh, waveform engineering. So this is the type of setup uh, that is used for that using the uh, Maui tuners uh, for the input and for the output. Now the, uh, the way we uh, do the model and the validation is, first of all, you have a first model, then which is actually here, you go do your simulation, then you redo your measurement, your load pool measurement, you refine some parameters, and then you inject them in the model, and then you have a model that is closer to uh, the, the load pool measurement that you are doing. Okay, so you will have a capability to, uh, to validate and to refine the model with the load pool measurement. Now, this brings us to the uh, vector receiver load pool measurements. I showed the setup a little bit uh, before, it was fast, but we'll go into more detail here. So load pool applications, we have different types of applications. Not everybody is starting from a model. So some people will just buy a device, you know, a package device, and they will uh, do their uh, load pool. Line. So it's a transistor characterization. They have an application. They want to have this transistor used, like in this evaluation board. And we would like to characterize it for a certain class of operation to get the maximum power, maximum efficiency, or the best uh, uh, combination of both. And this is, I would say, the majority of the, the cases uh, where people are doing load pool for power amplifier design. For that, they need a tuner. So what's a tuner? A tuner is very simple. You know, uh, when you look at it like that, it seems to be a very complex machine, but in fact, it's an airline, a probe, and two motors. One that moves the probe in the X axis, and one motor that moves the probe in the Y axis. Now, when I move the probe in the Y axis, I increase actually the uh, capacitance here. So I'm just going from 50 ohm to a higher gamma. And when I move the, y, the uh, probe in the X axis, I change the phase, okay? So I go from 50 ohm to my impedance by doing that. Now, when it comes to harmonic tuners, then it's a little bit complex. So let's say a little bit on this. Uh, now, Everybody knows about tuners. They are electromechanical tuners, okay? Now, why do we need an electromechanical tuner? Does it need to be automated? No, it does not. The magic word is it needs to be pre-calibrated. And the reason why it needs to be pre-calibrated is if we are using, and here we are talking about the, uh, the beginning of the loop. The reason is if you are measuring with a power meter at the output, you have your device at the input here. So I'm moving my gamma and I'm measuring a certain uh, power. So uh, at this level, let me just add a note here. Oh, let's do this. So, so we said we have a power meter here, okay, at the output, and my DUT is here. All right. Now, while I'm tuning, okay, in different uh, impedances, my power is increasing and I'm happy. At a certain time, my power will drop. And then I will say, okay, well, 
if I take this as the power and this as the tuning, then I will say at this tuning point, I have my maximum power, so I'm happy. Then I measure the, the loss of this tuner. And I say this tuner has three dB loss. So in fact, this power that I measure here, the device has three dB more. So this is the power of my DC. Okay, and this is a way to see it. But the question is, did you get the optimum? The answer is no. Why? Because the loss of a tuner is not linear. The loss of a tuner changes dramatically, especially when you start getting in this area here, close to the edge of the smooth chop. So if you look at the loss, it's like something doing this. So the loss is very low when you are in this region, and then suddenly it does this. Well, not going back, okay, here, up like this, okay? So if my loss is going fast, then probably, the reason why my power is dropping is not because my device does not give more power, it's because the loss of the tuner is covering this power. So in fact, my optimum should be at this position because at this position, my loss is bigger. So my optimum power of the device is here. How can I know that? The only way to know that is to have a pre-calibrated tuner, okay? So the magic word in a tuner is not automated. The magic word in the tuner is pre-calibration. You are able to pre-calibrate this tuner. Okay. Now, uh, let me go back here. And let me clear this. So it's not going to be clear or growing. Perfect. So remember, I told you this was at the beginning where people were using power meters. Now people are not using power meters. What are they using? They are using VNAs. And this is what we call vector receiver load pool. Vector receiver load pool is not something that is uh, new. It, it, it was there, but it was not practical. Okay, the reason for that is in the VNA based load pool or the vector receiver load pool, we are not using power meters. We are using the receivers of the VNA to measure the power. And these powers are measured, in fact, by the A and B waves in the DNA. So in fact, here what we are measuring is A1, B1, B2, A2. And this is all I need to measure in deliver, PL, GP, PAE, and me name it, okay? Now, why is it now possible to do this? Because now we have access to low loss couplers. Because I'm measuring, you see, I'm measuring the A and B waves closest to the DUT. Why don't we use the couplers before the tuners and after the tuner, like here? And with that, we don't have a problem of loss of the DUT, of the, the couplers. Yes, it's possible. But if you are behind here, the tuner has loss at F0, and it has even more loss at 2F0 and 3F0. It means that the power I will be measuring at 2F0 and 3F0 through the couplers will be so low that the VNA won't have enough dynamics measure. So in fact, I won't be able to know how much power I'm having at that moment. And this is something we would like to know, right? So we use the couplers between the tuner and the DT. Yes, it, it has a little bit of loss. The tuners will have, or the system will have lower gamma at the DUT reference plane. For the input, the tuner is not really important, okay? And when I say that, I, I have always my colleagues who are responsible for device characterization look at me and it's like, why, don't, don't, don't say that. Well, I tell them, you sell also preamplifiers, so it's okay. The reason why I say the tuner here is not important, it's, it's not that it's not important. It's not doing what the name says. It does not tune the device at the input. What we are doing with the source tuner is we are pre-matching the DT so that the power that I need here to, uh, to actually compress the DT is reduced. 
if I don't have a tuner, let's say, then I need for a 10 watt device here, I need probably 20 or 30 watt power amplifier here to compress the device because of the mismatch. We are going from 50 ohm to probably one ohm. But if I have a tuner that I pre match to certain impedance, then the power needed here is dropped. And power amplifiers cost you more than a tuner. So that's why we keep using tuners here because tuners then are uh, doing the job, okay? Now this method compared to the traditional load pool where we were using power uh, meters, we're relying a lot on the calibration of the tuners. Like I told you before, you know, it needs to be pre-calibrated. Now, I don't need actually to calibrate these tuners. Why? Because I'm measuring the, imp uh, sorry, I'm measuring the power before the tuner. So I'm having the output power and the efficiency and everything before the tuner. So the tuner presents a certain impedance. And if I have to tune it manually, so be it, because the power I will be measuring here will not depend on the loss of the tuner. The tuner is after, so it's not important. And with that, with this type of systems, we increase the accuracy of our load pool measurements by a lot. Also, with a system like this one, we can characterize our device easily and more accurately. For example, the PE delivered was something that we could not measure with a traditional load pool using power meters because we need the amplitude and phase. So we needed a vector measurement. And with this, we have the vector measurement. So in fact, you know, when, when, I, when I was telling you that the source tuner is not that important because we don't need to tune the device, it's true because I can measure the gamma in of the device in real time at any given power incident here. The, the tuner at the output is very important and it does the job because it needs to present or synthesize impedances, okay? So this is the story about the vector receiver loop. The vector receiver load pool is the way now to characterize a DC. Less and less people are using the traditional method using the, the power meters because it reached the, the limits long time ago. So now we needed the vector receiver load pool. And with this, we are able to characterize the DC. Now you see, I use the VNA here. What I need, in fact, is the access to the receivers on two ports because I need to measure A1, B1, A2, B2. All right, the rest stays the same. All right. Now, these are different uh, passive receiver load pools. Uh, so we can have very simple. So you're using an output tuner. Oh, you see, oh, you see here, there is no tuner at the input. Why? Because the power needed to drive this device is very low. So we can use the power that is already just from the VNA. But you see, I don't need a tuner input here. Same thing. So the power is important. If we don't have enough power, we need to add a DC. So this seems to be a high power device. And to be able to drive it, we need a source tuner. Okay. So these are the, the, the typical uh, setups that we can use for low pool. It can be very simple, medium, or a high power setup. And what we are looking for is actually to characterize for every impedance in a certain pattern, like in here, we are choosing this pattern. And for every impedance, we do a power sweep. So we are able, in fact, for a certain output power to see where is the optimum uh, impedance for maximum P out or maximum efficiency and so on. So once you do your measurements and the advantage of doing vector receiver load pool is you don't need to tell what parameters you want to measure because you are just measuring four parameters, A1, B1, A2, uh, sorry, not even A2. Now let's say A2, so A1, B1, A2, B2, okay? With these four parameters, I can extract any power I need or anything. Of course, you need to measure the, vo the voltage and the current consumption to calculate your PAE and efficiency. All right, so let me go back here. Now, 
You remember I was talking about the losses of these couplers? So imagine that if I calibrate this tuner alone, I can reach this gamma with the tuner that is shown here by the blue circle. So the outer circle of the blue ring is actually the tuning range of a tuner. But the moment I, do, I add a loss between the tuner and the DT, beta the input or the output does not matter, the gamma will automatically shrink. So now at this reference plane or at the beauty reference plane, this is the maximum gamma I can reach, which is the uh, yellowish uh, orange uh, region. Now, in some cases, on small devices, this can be, uh, or on, on certain devices, this can be okay. We can reach the gamma we want, we can get our data. But in some other cases, it's not possible. Okay? So when a passive system like this one gets you results where your circles are not closed, means you are not reaching the the optimum impedance for this device, then we need to use what we call an active load pool system or a hybrid active load pool system. And what does mean a hybrid active load pool system or an active load pool system is I synthesize a virtual impedance that is seen by the duty. And why do we call it a virtual impedance is because uh, let me show first here. What is the gamma here? What is the gamma seen by the device? It's actually the A2 over B2. Okay, so you have B2 coming like this, A2 coming back. This is the reflection from the DUT. So A2 over B2 is the gamma that is seen by the DUT. All right. Now, if I have a B2, and then I take a power coming from a synthesizer, going into a loop, uh, 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 an amplifier, and then I send here a power of a value or a power A2, then the device sees a wave coming back, A2, and this synthesizing impedance. So the device things that he sees in impedance. Although everything is switched on, but actually it's the ratio of the power coming from the output, which is A2, over the power coming out of the DUT, which is B2, we have a certain gamma. Now, the beauty of it is I can crank up this power as I want. And in fact, I can have A2 bigger or larger than B2, which means I can have a gamma that is higher than one. Well, don't try that. <laughs> you may blow the device. But it means that I can have a gamma that is very, very close to the edge of the system. So the limitation that we saw here does not exist anymore in an active system. However, it has a, a, a drawback. What is the drawback? Drawback is we have a device that has an output impedance of 1 ohm. We have a power amplifier that has an output impedance of 50 ohm. To be able to overcome this mismatch and inject the power, remember the same story I told you about the input? Well, we have now this, this story about the output in active. Well, it needs 10 times the power from the output. So for a 10 watt device, I will need a 100 watt power amplifier to be able to synthesize that 1 ohm. And this does not take into account any losses in between. So for that, when the device is high power, this becomes a little bit cumbersome and very uh, expensive solution. When the device is small, this can be a good solution. Fast, very simple, neat, just you plug a few cables and you are ready to run. Then when the devices are high power, this becomes quite complex. So what do we do? We go where we call the hybrid active load pool, which is, well, hybrid between the passive, so we add a tuner, 
and we add the injection. So the tuner acts like a pre-match. So let's say the device is one ohm, we bring this tuner to five ohm, and the rest is done by the power amplifier. Okay, so let's go back to my annotation. Uh, so if we have a Smith chart, sorry for my X Smith chart. Oh, all right, good. So my amplifier here is 50 ohm. My device is probably here. How do I go from here to here? Well, I can put the tuner at this impedance. All right. And then the active injection will just bring me from here to here. So the power that I need to go from 5 ohm, with certain uh, imaginary uh, part, of course, to this impedance is much lower than going from 50 ohm to this impedance. OK? And you can do the calculation. It's quite a lot. So one thing that is good is using the tuner, I can put myself in the right phase because actually with the phase, it also uh, increases the power. So I put myself in the right phase here. Then I put a certain gamma to reach a certain pre-match and I let my active do the rest, okay? Uh, rotation, let's clear now this, we're all drawing. And go back. Oh, didn't do it. Sorry. Uh, oops. Yeah, okay. Now, these are different active and hybrid active systems. From the simplest solution using a DNA, DNA that has two sources, I have a signal at the input, I have a signal from the output. I use the couplers inside the DNA because, as you know, the, tuner, the DNA has couplers inside. It means this device is very low power and I can do low pulse. I can do active low pulse. Or I can use the uh, Alterata MT2000 from uh, Maori, who has all the capabilities to do active low pull as well. Then we have what we call the hybrid, where you can see that we have the tuners. And we have the power amplifier, we can see it here, to drive the power from the output to uh, compress the device. And finally, you can have the on wafer, which is, you know, uh, uh, another type of systems when you are doing measurements on wafer. Uh, if you noticed, all we talked about here was, or before, was connectorized, meaning coaxial, all right? So we're talking about frequencies up to 60, 70 gigahertz. So everything is coaxial. But what happens when we are dealing with waveguide or with, uh, you know, higher frequencies uh, for radar applications, for example, 70, 70 gigahertz and so on? So we use tuners that are waveguide. Now, in waveguide, the problem is we don't have couplers in between, okay, between the tuner and DC because the, there is no instruments that will measure directly from the couplers in waveguide. It doesn't exist. And using one millimeter cables to go from one millimeter coupler here to there, the losses will be too much, so it's not possible. That's why uh, Maori developed a solution based on uh, the uh, waveguide uh, setup. And you can see here there is a block A and a block B. So what's the block A? Block A are uh, a custom low loss couplers, okay, that they uh, designed uh, with a third party company. And the couplers actually in are integrated with a down converter. So the signal coming out of the deep of the tuner here at a certain um, at a certain frequency is uh, down converted and measured in coaxial mode on the DNA. So it means it's measured at lower frequency. Same thing for the output. A signal coming from the DUT is down converted, measured 
and then the tuner does the tuning, all right? And then we have another block, which is the amplifier and phase control, which gives us the, uh, the, uh, the control of the amplitude and the phase to be able to synthesize the right impedance in active mode. This is a unique cell, okay, that can do this type of uh, measurement in WebGuide. And uh, there are a lot of interest in this, uh, in this uh, setups because many people have their setup in WebGuide, like this one, but actually they are limited in gamma. They cannot reach the gamma they want. So with the simple upgrade of their system, they are now able to, uh, to reach the gamma they want at uh, WebGuide frequency, which means WR15, WR12, and WR10. And the setup looks like this. Uh, in reality, it looks less crowded than actually in the schematic, in my opinion. Uh, so uh, we have the uh, we have the DT, which is uh, probably here, yes. And then we have the couplers with the uh, down conversion here, and we are measuring with a DNA, and it can be any uh, DNA. I think there is a different frequency down conversion, and you can have the DNA. Uh, actually, a 50 gigahertz DNA can do the job, even if you are working at 110 gigahertz. So with that, we're able to reach a gamma of 0.92 at 80 gigahertz. And this is not a DUT reference plane, you know, that's very important. And this is, well, usually uh, the gamma we can reach with this setup like this is probably 0.55 or 0.6 maximum. Nowadays, terahertz is, all, is also very important, okay? And uh, I like this applications because uh, not only for the load pool. I started liking this application just for the 50 ohm as parameter measurements. So what is this setup? This setup is, you know, you have uh, terahertz uh, or millimeter wave uh, heads. Well, VDI heads, for example, are going up to 325 or even 1.1 terahertz, and you are measuring it duty. Now, the problem is with these heads is we cannot control the power. As we are not controlling the power, in some cases, the measurements we are doing on a device just for S parameters, the power is too high. So actually, we are compressing the device. So our S parameter measurements already are not good enough. And the only way to, to, to play with that is you reduce the power, you redo your calibration, you reduce your power, you do your calibration. It's very tedious. This company, Vertigo, which is a partner of Maori Microwave, has uh, developed a solution that does a calibration, a power calibration of a 50 ohm setup like this one using the VDI or the T size uh, millimeter, uh, millimeter heads and enables actually the possibility to control the power by software. So this solution is only software solution. And with that, you're able to reduce the power and do the measurement on a device without having to recalibrate each time. So you can even do a power sweep on the device, okay? And have the uh, linear region and the compression region. So you know where is your linear region. So you can you do your, uh, you can do your S parameter measurements in that region without any problem. Now, if I can control the power, okay, I'm gonna come back here. If I can control the power, then I can inject the power from the output. So in fact, if I am able to control the power also from the output, I can inject more power than I have from the input because I can have a control, independent control of the millimeter wave. And that's what brings me to an active low pool setup at the terahertz level. Now, at this level, the power that is needed to do the active injection is quite low. So you don't need that much power. So that's why power from the receiver, from the uh, VMA is sufficient to do uh, low pool. And you can see here, so for example, we can have different gain compressions of different impedances. 
uh, we have the impedance here, and this is all active load pool measurements. This is done at 125 gigahertz, 135 gigahertz, and here this is a multi-stage PA at 250 gigahertz. So the development toward terahertz application in load pool is going, and this is something that we won't have charged but to be able to support. So we already supported now with the uh, vertical solution. And we are quite happy with this solution because it's uh, it's quite impressive. Now we talked about local measurements to do device characterization. So we can characterize a device, find the optimum impedances for the maximum power, maximum efficiency. From that, we take the impedances that need that are needed. We go on ABS and we synthesize a matching circuit, and we can go on momentum. And from there, we develop our uh, demo board or our power amplifier. But in some cases, people would like to design a power amplifier using a model. Okay, so we can go back to the compact model, right? But imagine now we have a model on a package device because not everybody has a, a fab. So some fabless companies or even some uh, just some companies that that do uh, power amplifier design, they just buy components on the market. Okay, so they buy they buy a, a package device and they want to do their uh, they want to develop their application. Now what happens is in a package okay we have a lot of uh parasitics that needs to be characterized okay and those are the parasitics we are showing here you have the rain source gate bound wires because you need to wire bond the uh the the device to the package you have the mutual coupling you have the capacitance here and uh, C1 and C3, so the mature coupling in terms of capacitance and the capacitance of the uh, of the ceramic uh, and uh, sorry of the metal, and then you have the pre-matching metal uh, capacitors. Uh, you have some other resistance for the metallic um, access. So there are other parameters. So we already did three months of compact modeling, and then now we need to add to it all these phenomena. So what we do is we take our uh, our model and then we measure the, 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 the package and we start playing with all these parameters until the measurements and the model starts getting together, uh, or simulations start getting together. But this is a tedious job for a company that buys a device on the market and wants to design the PA. Again, the objective is to reduce the design cycle. You want people to be able to design their power amplifier in a very short period of time, okay? So they cannot wait six months before getting their PA designed. So we need to go fast. And to be able to go fast, we need, instead of having a package transistor uh, with all the elements, we don't need a model like this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a black box model, okay? And what we call a black box model is a PhD or an ePhD model. Now, there are different type of models. There is the physical model where you have a very good extrapolation accuracy, very good physical insight. The operating range is very good. The convergence is quite fair. But the problem is you cannot model it. Yeah, it's very difficult to model. And it's mostly in our case, and this is the, 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 the important case is we cannot use it for circuit design. Okay, or almost not use it for circuit design. There is the compact model that can actually have a good or fair response on all these conditions, but the problem is the time. 
And the PhD model, or for some people they know it as the X parameters, well, it has, it's easy to model. It can be used by circuit uh, simulator. You have no physical insight. Uh, the extrapolation is very limited. The convergence uh, fair. And the operating range is also limited because it works only at the frequency, at the bias, and at almost the power you uh, you extracted. Okay. Now, AMCAD developed a what we call a, an enhanced PhD model, and uh, with that we try to make it easy to, uh, to 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 train the model. Can be used for design uh, for the circuit design. Okay, but we played, we worked a lot on the conversions and also on the extrapolation accuracy. So let's start with a PhD, traditional PhD, okay, polyharmonic distortion. So the PhD is a first order expansion. And what does that mean? means that we're using a, what we call a tickle tone. And this tickle tone will, uh, will create a perturbation. So here we have a signal at the input and we have our signal at the output. And then we inject the signal here at the output. And this signal is in fact a second harmonic signal, okay, with a phase difference but the amplitude of this signal is fixed. So what we say is we have a linear perturbation around a nonlinear state, okay? And this is the first order. Oh, sorry, went too fast. The EPHD is actually a third order expansion. And what does that mean? It means that we have a perturbation that we create, but in fact, it's a nonlinear perturbation around a nonlinear state. And these are the second and the third order. In fact, the, uh, the model extraction is quite automated. So the software will decide which order to use, second or third, uh, by just checking the, uh, uh, the error function. And the, the one that reached the, uh, the error function reached the, the minimum that we are looking for, then we can stop there, okay? Because the idea also is to create a model that is easy to simulate, not the most complex model that will not uh, enable us to convert or it's very difficult to simulate. So for those who are familiar with the X parameters, for example, you see this is, a model of X parameters. So for each impedance, so you, you have your tuner and you have a, you synthesize a pattern of impedances. Those are the, uh, uh, the red or the uh, pink points. And then for every impedance, there is a power sweep and there is this perturbation. So we create a model around this impedance. And then we create another model around this impedance and so on. So we will create as many models as we have of impedances. Now, as for example, in this region, we can see that all the models are uh, close to each other. So I can easily interpolate between the impedances because I have a, a high density of uh, impedance. But at the edge here where I have a less dense uh, number of points, then the interpolation between two impedances will not lead to a good result, okay? The EPHD tried to solve this problem by creating a nonlinear perturbation around a nonlinear state. So in fact, what we do is instead of creating different models for every impedance, we create only one model that will cover all these impedances. So not only we can do easily the interpolation, but can, we can even go a little bit into extrapolation and we will see that in an example later, okay? Now, another point is, as I'm creating as many impedances, uh, as many models as I have impedances, the files 
or the, the yeah the file size of a model of an F parameter model or a PhD model is a huge compared to an EPHD. Okay. And now we see also that the extraction time is also a uh, factor. Again, the load pool system that is needed for that is the same one that you would use for the validation of or refinement of a compact model. So we need the tuner of the input again to uh, to be able to compress the device, and we need a harmonic tuner of the output to be able to control the impedances of the second, third harmonic, and of course the fundamental. The phase reference is also needed because we are talking about time domain to be able to extract the model that takes into account the second and the third uh, harmonic. The model extraction is, uh, or the measurements that are needed for the model extraction are uh, very important. So, for example, for the, uh, as I said, for the PSG model, it takes a lot of time because if we have the control of the harmonics, then for every impedance of the third harmonic, we need to do a sweep of the second harmonic. And for every impedance of the second harmonic, we need to do a sweep of the fundamental. So in fact, it's a uh, 3D dimension uh, sweep. It's a nested sweep. While for the uh, EPHD model, what we do is we do a first load pool on the device where we find the not the optimum necessarily, but the region of the optimum of the uh, of the device where we want to have our application. Same for two and zero, same for three and zero. Then we create a pattern around this called optimum. It does not need to be the real optimum, by the way, but we can select this. Uh, that's why we call it Z reference. I always here Z reference. I have it somewhere in this. Uh... Okay, well, we use it reference impedance instead of optimum impedance. So we find, we, we do a pattern, circle pattern around this reference impedance. Same thing for 2F0. 2F0 and 3F0, there are some uh, freedom. We can do either a pattern around the reference or we can do a 360 around the same stuff, does not matter. The only uh, the only point that is important is we need to, to, to measure at the reference. So with that, we are able to do a measurement at F0 by fixing to F0 and to F0 at the reference. Then we go back, we, we put F0 at the reference and we do the sweep of to F0. And then we do the sweep of to F0. So what I need is 49 plus 7 plus 7 in start, instead of 49 times 7 times 7. So with that, I reduce the, uh, the measurement time dramatically. Also, we don't need a tickle tone. We don't use a tickle tone. So I don't need to inject a signal from the output that can be very cumbersome when we are using high power devices. So what we do then is we use a harmonic tuner and it's the harmonic tuner that creates actually these uh, impedances and that will generate the model. So we extract the model. Now this is uh, the type of results you can expect with the model where we see for different impedances, we are doing a power sweep and we are able to get uh, a good agreement for all the impedance. One thing that is important is uh, our model that uh, still converge even outside the region where we did our uh, our measurement. So in red, it's the measurement, and in blue, it's the model. And we can see that the model is still uh, that is still converging even outside the region where we did the measurement. And this is uh, quite important. As an application, and this is a project that uh, I'm carried with the uh, French Space uh, Agency, it's to develop a Doherty power amplifier. And with that, they said, what we have is a device on the shelf device that we'd like to characterize in the class AB, class C, and from there, we would like to design a Doherty power amplifier. So they did the measurements of the class AB and the model. 
Then we did the measurements and the model in class C. Now the class C is quite challenging because, sorry, because at lower power, there is no gain. And as there is no gain, and this is the class E, so it's the peaking. So actually the, uh, the main, what happens is the main will inject in the peaking. And as it injects, so the impedance seen by the class C is outside the Smith chart when there is no power. And when the power starts kicking in, that's where the impedance starts getting inside. This is the design of the power amplifier. We have the place, class C here, class AB here. This is the design in ABS. This is a better picture. So we have a driver and we have our door to there. And the idea is after that is to measure the power amplifier at 3.7 and compare with the design. So we did the, the validation and we can see that we can reach a good agreement. So you remember, we have a, a model. The model is valid uh, at this uh, uh, at this uh, frequencies. Now, uh, there are some other slides that were removed, but we can see, for example, that this model can allow uh, impedance uh, interpolation and extrapolation, and it can even allow frequency interpolation, okay? So if you are interested in such work, just uh, let me know, and I can send you the uh, paper about it. Now we talked about load pool, and load pool seems complex. Okay, because a lot of equations, a lot of equipment, a lot of uh, things to, 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 to take care of and to care about, the tuner calibration and so on. And now we're going to talk about noise. Noise is a very simple mathematic. It's actually a model of uh, four uh, unknowns, but it's, in my opinion, the most uh, difficult thing to measure <laughs> and this is due to the uh, type of instrument and i think the technology of the instruments that we are having and now we're going to talk about noise measurement <clears throat> uh, uh are you are you okay we can uh, continue do you guys want to have a break uh yogesh what what do you think about the uh, the case is it okay Hello? Yes, it's fine. Yeah, okay, so let's continue then. All right, perfect. So uh, we're gonna talk about uh, noise. So for, uh, for noise, we are talking about the reception of the signal and uh, resulting uh, length. So for example, uh, the transmitter power, so we increase the transmitter power and this is a, like yelling, okay? And then you have someone who needs to hear this signal and that's what we call about the receiver and the uh, we, it needs to be sensitive. So the guy needs to put his hand on the ear and try to hear what you are saying. The problem is if you have a noise in between, then it becomes, problematic. And that's the channel. The channel will have noise. So you're going to need to characterize that. The channel will have noise, the power amplifier will have noise, everything will have noise. So we need to be able to take that into account. So what is the effect of this? The more power you're going to be using between the base station and your device, the more power you're going to be using the more battery life you're gonna need on your device, okay? Now, the more distance or the if the noise floor is too high, then I need my device to be closer to the base station. It means I need more base stations to be able to get the signal correct. So the idea is to find the right uh, compromise between the power and the distance. 
which means between power and the sensitivity of the receiver. Noise figure has been measured and for a very long time. So the definition of the noise figure is the signal over noise at the input or the signal over noise at the output. And then the no this is sorry, the noise value. And the noise figure is just the logarithmic expression of the noise value. When we have an amplifier, we have a signal at the input, which has also some noise because it's coming from the signal. And then after the power amplifier, we will have an amplification of the signal, but of course we'll have also an amplification of the noise. We've been using different methods to characterize the noise. So there is the Y-factor method. So the Y-factor method is a method that does not require knowledge about the device. So now you can see it this way. Well, I'm measuring, in the first step, I'm measuring uh, cold noise power, okay? Which means that my noise source is off. That's what we call cold noise power. And then we add a noise source where we excite a noise source in a hot condition, and then we measure the noise power again. And the Y factor is the ratio between the hot measured power over the cold measured power. And from this expression, we are able to get the uh, noise figure of the DUT, the noise figure of the gain of the DUT, uh, and this is what we are looking for, okay? So for example, in a case like this one, we measure the power at hot, we measure the power at low, we are able in fact to trace this line. And if we do the calculation, we will find that this is the noise added by the amplifier. And if we calculate just by the, by the, uh, the line that you see, which is the, uh, the, 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 the slope of this line is the, the gain, then we can see that the device has around 20 dB. So we can fall on our step again, on our uh, feet again. So with this method uh, called uh, the hot uh, the hot cold, we call it also the hot cold method or the Y factor method, we are able to find the noise added by the uh, power amplifier. Now I will go to this other. So now the noise failure measurement using the cold only means what? Well, I will put my source only in cold and then I will measure the power. But then what I would need as an information is the gain of my DC. So based on the power measurement and based on the measurement of the DUT. So I need to know the DUT a little bit in advance. So I measure the S parameter of the DUT to get that information. The advantage is the gamma source that the device see is only one gamma source, which is the gamma source at T cold. Before here, I don't know if I have a picture, no, I don't. But when I am in hot cold, as the, as the uh, noise source changes from cold to hot, my gamma source may change also. And this is not taken into account in the calculation. So this can be a source of error. Also, the Y factor needs to measure the power at the hot and cold. If, for example, the, uh, the receivers are uh, compressed there between the hot and cold, then you won't be able to get this uh, the, the noise power. The other thing is, if the device in hot cold, for example, if the device uh, has a very low noise power, okay, or noise uh, figure, then the measurement error here will cover this noise figure. So it becomes very difficult to measure the noise figure of uh, for devices that has low noise figure using the hot cold method because of all the uncertainties that we are adding. Where in cold method, 
we are measuring with only one gamma source. We are measuring the DOT. So we have a better control actually on the, we can adjust the right receiver uh, dynamic to measure the right power. So we can measure quite low uh, noise figures. And this is the method that is mostly used when we are characterizing power uh, LNAs or transistors for uh, LNAs. So the idea here is as I know the gain, then I measure only one point. I know the gain, so I have this line and I can find my power, uh, my noise from the power profile or from the, sorry, from the uh, transistor. Now, as I was saying before, in power amplifier devices, the load pool measurement, we are relay, relaying on the instrument to measure. We will have to do the same thing here for uh, the noise. But the difference is, as I am measuring power for load, the dynamic is not an issue. The noise level is not an issue. Okay, even the connection repeatability is less of an issue. Okay, it's not that critical. Now measuring hundred watts, well, hundred watts, hundred point zero one watt, well, that's not a big deal. You cannot do, you cannot have the same assumptions here in noise uh, for measurements. So in reality, when we are talking about noise power, uh, sorry, noise parameters, uh, we are talking about the four noise parameters. So to give you uh, uh, an analogy with the S parameters, when I'm measuring a noise figure, it's like I'm measuring a gain of the duty, okay? It's by analogy, so if I, if I measure the gain of the DOT, it tells me this DOT has a certain gain when it's terminated by these two impedances. That's it. That's the only information I can get. Noise figure, same thing. If I measure the noise figure of, the, of a DOT, it tells me this is the noise figure of the DOT when terminated by this gamma source. That's it. That's the only thing I can measure. Now, if I have the same device and I measure the four S parameters, then I can plug the gain circuit, and with that, I can tell, oh, this device can have certain gain if terminated by such or such impedance. So in fact, I have a model of this DOT. Same thing are the noise parameters. If I have the four noise parameters, which are NF min, gamma up, and RM, then I am able to trace the noise circles and predict the noise figure when the device is terminated by a certain gamma. So, okay, so this is what we are looking for. So noise parameters is the model we are looking for. And this is the model. So the noise figure is equal to NF min, this is one of the unknowns, plus four times Rn, and this is the variation of the noise okay so the slope in fact so the variation of the or the sensitivity of the noise the noise and we have the gamma out which is the gamma at which we have minimum noise figure and the gamma out of course is in amplitude and phase that's why we say we have four noise parameters f min gamma opt, opt, uh, amplitude gamma up phase and rm so we need these four uh, uh, parameters. As we have an equation with four parameters, four unknowns, so it means we need to do four sets of measurements at different gamma source to measure four noise figures. And from there, we can extract the ethnic. This is the the general method, but the theoretical method, let's say. But in reality, because of the sensitivity of the receivers, because of the errors we have in the uh, in the uh, in the system, because of the uh, repeatability of the measurement, because of many things, we need to over determine this uh, equation. So we need to make much more measurement that we have as a known. So usually we do 12, uh, 10 to 12 measurements uh, for the, to extract the four gamma source. And then we use 
uh, some mathematic expressions can be the SVDs, can be the Lisbon square, and from there we extract the parameters. These are the setups. Now, you remember I was talking about the sensitivity and the repeatability and all that. In a noise setup, we cannot allow ourselves to connect and disconnect a setup during the calibration. We cannot, because if we do that, we will not have good results. So we need to use switches. But switches also are not perfect. So we have to live with that error. But at least the error of a switch is something we can note, we can characterize and we can predict and we can have a kind of an uncertainty errors. Better than have uncertainty of uh, connecting and disconnecting to uh, two cables. Okay. Also, the gamma source usually it has a certain ENR, and that ENR will, in, will induce, or just the noise source will induce around 0.1 dB of error into the noise figure measurement. Okay, so that's inherent to a noise system. The calibration has to follow certain steps. So the first thing we do, we calibrate the DNA at the cable, then we calibrate the DNA at the DOT, uh, then we calibrate uh, the DNA only from the output, and this is to measure the gamma source. Uh, then we calibrate the tumor, and all this has to be done in an automated way, just by changing the switch position. A receiver is everything you see here. It means it can be an MF, by the way, uh, this is uh, using a, a noise figure meter, but we can use the option 29 of a VNA of the PNA axe, and we can have this connected to the port two, and we can use everything from the VNA. But just for the sake of illustration, we have the VNA and we have the noise figure meter. So the noise figure meter plus the switches represents in fact the receiver, and we need to calibrate this receiver Okay, to this digital reference space. So we need to find the noise parameters of this receiver to be able to do the calculation. Then we measure the duty, the S parameter of the duty. We do the measurement of the noise power by changing the tuner positions, and then we calculate the noise parameter. The setup looks like this. Okay. Now, what do we have in each box? In the uh, in the NSM here, what we have is, of course, the bias T. We have the switches to switch between the DNA path and the noise source path. Okay. And for the output one, we have a little bit more. We have the switches, of course. We have the bias Cs, but we also have an LNA. And this LNA here is very important because if we want to measure duties with low noise figure, I need to reduce the noise figure of my receiver. The way to reduce the noise figure of the receiver is to increase the gain and reduce the noise figure of the first switch. And with that, we use an LNA. We use an LNA in this box. This LNA will have low noise, uh, low noise figure and high gain. And with that, it covers actually all the noise figure of the DNA or the noise figure meter or so on. So this is very important. And the type of results is something like this, where we get on wafer, for example, from 8 to 50 gigahertz. Uh, we have an NF mean from, point nine, uh, from point 0.35 to 0.9 dB. And we have the gamma opt, and we have the RN, of course. Now, this seems simple, but in reality, when we choose these 10 impedances, we can choose them. So, you know, we have these noise circles here, right? The impedances we choose to create uh, or to, to, to measure the power, we choose them so that they are well scattered in this region, 
okay? Because if I wanna create a model of these circles, I need to measure approximately, you know, I need to measure quite everywhere in this circle. So as I have 10 points, this 10 point needs to be well scattered. If I choose the 10 point to be here, well, my model will be wrong. If I choose my 10 point to be on a line like this, my model will be wrong, okay? So the, choose, the, the choice of these impedances to do this 10 impedances uh, to extract the noise trigger are very important. So they are not just chosen uh, uh, randomly. The other thing is uh, LNAs have tendency to have high gamma, gamma out, okay? And the, <clears throat> the NF have tendency to be close to the instability circle. So if I measure a point inside an instability circle, if my impedance is inside an instability circle, I cannot take into account that point. So in fact, I have certain conditions that I need to go to. So I put an impedance here and I monitor my ID. If my, uh, uh, keep in mind, we are measuring everything is very, very small signal here. So ID should not change no matter impedance I put, okay? But if I put, if I choose an impedance and I see that my ID is changing, then it means that I'm into an oscillation region. So I should not take into account that point. So this impedance is removed. I can also have what we call the mismatch factor where I make sure that my impedance that I choose is far enough from the instability circles. I calculate the M factor. So if the impedance is too close, I take it away. In some cases, I will choose an impedance and when I'm gonna read from the, uh, from the noise figure meter and I will do my calculation, my noise figure will be negative in dB. And this is not possible, it's not physical. So I need to remove that point. So you see when I say I have 10 impedances, in fact, I need to choose more than 10 impedances. And then while I'm measuring, I will remove the impedances that are not physical or that are creating instability or oscillations in the device. And I will choose only the impedances that are correct. And from there, I will do the extraction and I will have this curve. Okay, so there is a lot of, uh, how can I say, uh, it, it's not straightforward. Noise measurements are not like load pool measurements where I do my power sweep, whatever I have, I can trust because that's what the device is giving. Now, in noise, there are a lot of post-process. There are a lot of, uh, not even post-process, there are a lot of thinking during the measurement to say, does it make sense to have this kind of measurement? And the limitation now are the, are the instruments, okay? We are not, uh, we did not reach yet the level of uh, accuracy that we would like to have from the instrument. Now, if we wanna do good noise measure, the only solution that is really proven until now, and I'm sure it can be even made better, but for now the most proven solution is the one using the low noise figure uh, receivers from Keysight on the PNAX and Option 29. It may seem as a biased uh, statement. In fact, it's not because uh, I've been trying different measurements in noise and I worked with different companies. I worked with spectrum analyzers only and I worked with the uh, road edge work and all that. But noise measurements really need very, very accurate results and they, they cannot, you cannot use a regular uh, receiver of a VNA to do it. Keysight proposed two solutions, the option 29 and the option 28. The option 28 uses the noise, the, uh, the regular receiver of the VNA to extract. But if you wanna do that, the gain of your DUT and the, plus the gain of the 
uh, preamp needs to be over 40 dB to be able to measure something that makes sense. And this is not always the case because when we are usually measuring a device, a non 50 ohm device, the gain of the device, depending on the frequency, can go from minus 5 dB of gain to plus 20 dB of gain. So what's going to happen during all this transition? All the measurements will be wrong. Okay, so this is really based on experience. Noise measurement needs to have, you need to pay a lot of attention to noise measurement to get them correct and to trust them. Okay. Mouse, then clear, the all drawings, then good. Now we're gonna go to the system level. So what we saw until now is at the component level, we did the, the model of the component at the transistor level. We did the model of the device with a package. We did the low tool measurements to get the right impedances to, to, to create our or to uh, design our power amplifier. And now we did the noise measurement to design our LMA. Now we have all this equipment. What do we do with that? We need to build a system, a 5G system, an active antenna, a radar, something like that. So how we do that? We use a system architecture. A lot of people are using uh, system view, VSS, Simulink, and they are cascading different circuits doing DPD, uh, or envelope tracking or coding or uh, simulating an active antenna for massive MIMO. A lot of applications are now there. But what is missing is the right model of the circuit. Many companies are, for example, the one we're working on in 5G, they say, we have a power amplifier that we would like to design. We have a DPD algorithm. Now, the problem is we need to build the, the, this power amplifier, run the DPD algorithm, then modify the design of the power amplifier, design it again, manufacture it, go back to the DPD algorithm and run it and so on. And the reason why we don't have a good model of our amplifier. I'm not talking about this, the, the transistor. Now it's at the amplifier level. Okay. And how can we build a model of a full RF front end to be able to be used with DPD for so co-simulation, digital, and RF, and be able to have good results. And this is what vision is presenting. So for example, the, the, the context is we have this antenna from the uh, Rafale, okay? I know in India you have the Rafale. So the, uh, the, the, the radar of the Rafale, you know, as you saw before, there are a lot of components in it and a lot of antennas. And you need to be able to predict the beam steering of this antenna. So how are we going to simulate all that? We cannot simulate at the component level. We are talking about thousands and thousands of components. So the simulation at the component level is just impossible. So you need the simulation at the circuit level and at the system level. And you need data flow simulation to be able to do it correctly and also to be able to do a co-simulation in digital and RF. So this is the chain. So we have the baseband where you have the pre-distortion, the digital beamforming and the uh, coding. Then we have the up conversion or the down conversion, depending if it's a, a receiver or a transmitter. And then we have the beamforming network where we have the phase shifter and the attenuator. And then we have the RF front end where we have all the switches, the filters, the, uh, the mixers and so on. And of course the power amplifier. Now in terms of efficiency and all that, we concentrate on the power amplifiers because that's where all the, the non-linearities are happening. So for example, if you have an active antenna, as a very simple example, if your model does not take into account the bilateral effect or the mismatch effect, 
then you will not be able to take into account the mutual coupling between the elements. So when I have a, a, a radiation pattern like this, I will have different mutual coupling between the elements. So it's like an, a load pool uh, phenomena where you have a power going like this, and then because of the mutual coupling, you have a power coming back. And this power will affect your power amplifier, the last stage of your power amplifier. So if you are not able to take that into account, you will not have the right power and phase at each element, which means you will not be able to get your radiation pattern uh, radiating in the right direction. You will have an error of the main beam. Okay, this is a simple example. So the idea is we can take from EM simulation for HFSS, for example, we can have a simulation of the antenna. We can have a simulation of the circuit on ADS, like the power amplifier, or we can measure the power amplifier. And this, if we take this as a, as a data in for a mixer, filter, amplifier, phase shifter, then we create the right model for each one. And then we can cascade these models. And then we are able to do the simulation of the full model with the DPD, with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, all digital uh, co simulation. And we are able to uh, predict the behavior of the system just by the right model. Now, this model needs to take into account different phenomena. In reality, what does that mean? Imagine in our group, we have two uh, design houses and we have a customer, a big system design house. They are interested in our power amplifiers and they say, okay, get me the power amplifier. So what they are interested in is a power amplifier that they can simulate and get good results with. Perfect. Circuit design house A can give them a data sheet, but this will not be uh, enough. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, I'll go back to the question there. So, um, so the first design house can be the data sheet, okay, but that will lack information. It's not complete. It can give a lookup table, but that's time consuming into the design. Or we can give them our circuit design. But this is not something we want to do because they will buy only once. And that's because there is sensitive IP that you are giving them. And also for them, they cannot take this design and use it because there is heavy cost simulation they need to do because the design is at the component level and the conversions also. Okay? There will be convergence issue because the, the design will become bigger and bigger because this is at the system level, right? The other design, what uh, house, what they did is they created the behavior model of their power amplifier. The key competitive advantage is we protected the IP. It can be used in different domains. The data extraction can be done from the circuit or from the simulation or measurements or from the simulation. It can uh, it can be simulated very fast because it's compatible with data flow simulation and you can easily integrate it in a system simulator. So this is what we are looking for, is to create a behavior model of a circuit. Okay, in the same way we did it for the, uh, same way we did it for a device, uh, for, a for a transistor, package transistor. Now we're going to talk about memory effect and the behavior of a power amplifier. There are two uh, major phenomena that we need to take into account. Apart from the mismatch, the mismatch we know we use tuners and we can get the mismatch. But there are two other phenomena that we need to take into account is the, the high frequency memory effect and the low frequency memory effect. So what is the high frequency memory effect? Go back to my annotations. So 
Imagine I have a power amplifier like this. If I inject a CW signal and I do a power sweep at a certain frequency, I will have my gain like this, right? I will have a compression. If I change the frequency, I will have another curve that does probably this. If I change again the frequency, I will have another curve that does this and so on, okay? So this gives us the high frequency phenomena. It means for every frequency, I will have different response to the AM to AM conversion. And this is due to the matching circuit because my matching circuit will behave differently at each frequency. The impedance that I see here at F1 is different from the impedance I see at F2 and F3. That's why my gain is different. This is what we call the high frequency memory effect. And this is related to the AMAM conversion or AM to AM conversion. The other phenomena is about the transit time. And this is related to the AM to PM, okay? So for every power or for every, sorry, for every frequency, I will have a different AM to PM conversion. This is due to the time, to the transit time in the transistor. We call it high frequency memory effect or short term memory effect because the response is within nanoseconds to microseconds, okay? It has to do with very short term uh, response. Now the long-term memory effect or the low frequency memory effect, this has to do with the self-heating trapping effect and the bias circuit. Now I have some, no, not sometimes, but nowadays we hear about, can we do low pool with, uh, sorry, can we have a model, an EPHD model that takes into account uh, trapping effects? into a transistor? Well, not the, e, not the EPHD, not, not, not a behavior model. It's not, it's not possible. And because one of the phenomena that can give us the, this, uh, or uh, one of the, the, the components that will give us this phenomena or will give us a sense of this phenomena in our device is the bias circuit. But, the bias circuit in a, in, in a load pool is a bias T. So when you're gonna take that device and you're gonna put it on a, on a, on a demo board, that bias T is not there anymore. So one of the major components of your phenomena is gone. So you cannot characterize it, okay? While in a power amplifier, I can. So first of all, we're gonna talk about the bias. You remember when we are doing Pulsed measurements, my bias T's are very important because they need to be wideband. What does that mean? If I want to have a pulse going through this path here to the device, my, my uh, bias network needs to have enough bandwidth to have a full pulse. Otherwise, it will cut my pulse like this right? And this is not a pulse. So let's say my bias has 10 megahertz bandwidth to be able to have a pulse. And this is something that we can have easily. Good. Now, imagine now the same device where we are injecting two tones. Okay. Because again, this uh, low frequency memory effect in a CW signal does not mean much. It's really when we start talking about modulated signal. So imagine when we have a two-tone, <coughs> sorry. If I, imagine I have a two-tone of five megahertz spacing, okay? So if I have five megahertz spacing, then at the output, I will have the intermodes and I will have a baseband. And that baseband will be at five megahertz, okay? What does that mean? It means that that five megahertz will go through my bias circuit because my bias circuit has 10 megahertz bandwidth. So if it goes through my bias circuit, it means it will modulate my bias. 
So instead of being at a constant bias, I will be at a variation, a variating bias. If I am at a variating bias, what does that mean? It means that my gain will depend on the time. When the device is biased at this point, at this point, at this point, and so on. All right? So it means sometimes my device will be very hot compared to this condition here. So my gain will depend on where my bias is. And as this bias is modulated as a, at a low frequency, we call it low, uh, low frequency memory effect. Trapping of the device and the self-heating is also one of these phenomena. And because the time constant of the trapping is very long, that's why we also call it long memory effect. So this phenomena here will affect the performances of my power amplifier for in modulated signal. And we need to be able to characterize that when we are characterizing this power amplifier. So how can we see it? Remember when we do a load pool with the CW signal, the gain looks like a line like this. But if I have a modulated signal that has a time variant, uh, P in for example, that varies in time, then at the output I will have P out that varies also in time. And if I take point by point, the gain, it cannot be a line, it will be a cloud of points. So this is what we call the dynamic AMAM. And we would have the same thing with AMPM. And we need to be able to characterize that because if I want to create a DPD, a digital predistortion, I cannot do it with a line. It will, not, it will never be efficient. It will never be accurate. I need to use it with this dynamic load line to create the inverse function at the input so that at the end I have something that is linear. So how do we generate this model that takes into account all these phenomena? We use what we call a two-path model, okay? So what is the two-path model? The first path is we do a, a, a CW signal where we, uh, uh, we change the power and we change the phase. Uh, sorry, I change the power and we change the frequency. So we do a power sweep and frequency sweep. And at the output I have an amplification and I have a uh, frequency sweep. Now for the second path, I use two or three tones. Let's say I use two tones. It's, the same, it's similar, but uh, there are some uh, technicalities between them. So we use a two, a two tone and with the two tone, I can, I can cal calculate or so what I extract is what we call the conversion gain and the uh, parametric gain. And with that, we are able to extract uh, with the two kernels plus the short term kernel, we are able to extract a low and high frequency memory effect model. What does it look like? So imagine here we, we have this power amplifier design in ADS, okay? Harmonic balance. In harmonic balance, which is good, we can simulate a two-tone and we have the result. And we will use that as a reference, okay? Now, in data flow simulation, we can use uh, the, the, the vision model actually is uh, compatible with system view, Simulink or DSS. We extract the model in the data flow simulation. Now, uh, there is something important in the, in the data flow simulation. Uh, in data flow simulation, if we, there are some phenomena that cannot be taken into account, like for example, frequency transposition or uh, mismatch, these are not something you can take into account in data flow simulation. That's why in DSS or in system view uh, or even in simulating, they use what we call co simulation, where when you have a mixer, you will do the simulation until the input of the mixer, then you will go into the component level to do the simulation of the, of the, uh, of the mixer, then go back into system simulation and continue. Or 
in for mismatch the as this is time domain it, it, the signal goes into one direction so you have no mismatch effect but if we want our model to be able to simulate correctly the model from vision when it's exported to these simulators it's exported with the uh, with the engine with the um, solver so in fact it's not only a model it's a model plus a solver and all the calculation is done in the solver so you don't need to go do a cost simulation so everything is simulated at the data flow simulation level okay but using the solver from the model directly instead of using the solver of the uh, simulator so if we use the vision model here, we can see that we are able to uh, go and simulate the two-tone, the IND3 for a two-tone when we are sweeping the delta F. If we use a static model, like a PhD model, we are not able because the PhD model has no memory effect. Okay, so we cannot do that. If we use a high frequency memory effect also uh, only, we cannot extract the model correctly. We cannot predict the delta F and the IMD uh, result. And with the high frequency and low frequency model, we see that we are able. Now, you remember I was telling you about this company that is uh, developing power amplifiers. They say, we would like to be able to test our DPD algorithm on the model to make to, to be sure that it will work correctly. Because you have different people who are buying this uh, kind of uh, solutions. Let's say you are a power amplifier house. The system integrator like uh, Nokia and so on will never use your DPD algorithm, okay? Because they will not trust you. They will not trust your results. They will tell you, okay, uh, show me that it's linear, uh, that can be linearized, but then I will use my own DPD for it. And I will not share it with you because I spent too much money on it. So you need to be able to take your model off your power amplifier and give it to them. They test their DPD and say, okay, it's working. So then you can design that power amplifier. Otherwise you're gonna be back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with them. And that's gonna be tiring and very costly so people and sometimes they need to test different dpds so they cannot just start tuning and rebuilding power amplifiers so they need to be able to do it at the uh, at the simulation level and this is very important same thing for radar when you have a radar and you are not able to predict the uh, the beam forming or the the main uh, the beam steering then you cannot just take the antenna and go in the nuclear chamber and start doing all the calibration of the antenna all the time. It's cost a lot of money. But if you have the right model, you can exert or you can calibrate virtually the antenna and predict the uh, the, the beam steering and the, the, the radiation pattern. And this is where we are going with this. So for example, here, we see that uh, we have a first model, and uh, that model is monolithic less. And when you apply your the DPD, you have very good results. But in fact, if we get the model that takes into account low frequency and high frequency memory effect, the DPD is not sufficient. And so that's why people like Nokia, Ericsson, all that they say we cannot trust actually the result from your DPD because I don't know what you are doing with that. I need to apply my own DPD on your model to make sure that your result, your power amplifier is correct. All right, I think I went a little bit too fast on this because I see the time uh, running. But again, uh, if you have any question about this, we can put that at the end or we can I can send you also uh, more information about it. Don't hesitate, please. If you need anything, let me know, send me an email, and I will get you whatever you need. All right, uh, mandatory, I need to go through some uh, uh, solutions from our microwave, our partner, uh, that uh, includes some uh, uh, components, 
so the device uh, characterization applications, uh, like we saw before, we have active uh, load pool for uh, PA design for 5G, Wi-Fi, and general application. We use the MT2000 system. Uh, the advantage of the system is it can sense the size and impedance that is wideband. So if you have a signal uh, at, uh, with 100 megahertz bandwidth, it will synthesize an impedance over the handwidth. So uh, over the 100 megahertz, sorry, over the bandwidth, over the 100 megahertz. Uh, if you need more information, just let me know. Antaverta or uh, uh, active load pool for uh, 5G, and I will send you the information about it. Of course, the load pool system using uh, the tuners, the noise parameter extraction, uh, the pulse IV, pulse test parameters, uh, behavior model extraction. So different setups for different application, mobile phone testing and so on. Of course, Maui also uh, does different uh, components, different, I mean, uh, products, the tuners, automated tuners, manual tuners, uh, the Pulse ID with the uh, uh, partnership of AMCAD Engineering. We have a Pulse SMU also uh, with AMCAD Engineering. Uh, instrument power amplifiers also are there. Uh, noise modules, couplers, biases, test pictures, multiplexers for active injection. This is very important. Precision. Remember, I was talking about the uh, the noise precision is very important. So use the right tools, use the right calibration uh, kit. DNA Cal kit is very important. Uh, take care of your calibration kit. Clean them very, very often. Clean them every time you want to use them. Uh, it's very important, especially the mechanical one. Um, there are some noise receivers in cryogenic uh, level. So we have uh, solutions like that. Uh, stop tuners, uh, this gets me back like 20 years when I used to tune my antennas with this, uh, with these three stops. And also uh, this uh, software called Insight. And this is a software that helps you calculate the uncertainties of your measurements, taking into account different uh, phenomena like the noise of the VNA, the drift of the VNA, the repeatability of the connection of the cables, uh, the, the bending of the cables. And so on. So you can characterize your setup and be able to trace the uncertainties uh, of your measurements. Of course, there are different <coughs> cables uh, for VNA, phase stable, low profile for uh, on wafer measurements, uh, general purpose. Uh, of course, I'm, uh, Maori is a metrology lab, so it has a, a lot of metrology adapters, uh, color coded adapters and this is very um, uh, interesting product especially for uh, labs in schools uh, even outside actually the military use them a lot uh, because there is a color code so you know that the the yellow cannot be connected to anything else than a yellow so sometimes to make the difference between 1.85 millimeter and 2.4 millimeter if you are not expert is quite difficult or uh, 3.5 and 2.9 you need to uh, to be expert in that otherwise you just use the color and then you know that the red goes with the red and the blue with the blue uh, lab grad adapters attenuators torque wrenches use please the torque wrenches those are your friends in the lab uh, and the gauge to make sure that your pins are uh, still okay. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you. Uh, please visit our website, amcadengineering.com and maurimicrowave.com. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm open to all your questions so we can go through the list of questions. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jajaria, for a wonderful talk. So I would like to audience, if they have any questions, so they can ask directly to you. Thank you. Thank you again for giving wonderful talk. No problem. I think there are some questions in the chat. Yeah, I, I asked uh, this question. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Actually, so, I, I am a few days ago, I am involving in the load pool measurement. So okay. I would like to ask these questions, which I have written to you. Okay, so can you uh, briefly describe how do we do load pool measurement? Yes. 
that including intimacy and power suite. Okay. Uh, all right. So let me then go back to the load tool. In fact, this is in IDCAD, right? You are using yeah. IDCAD? Right, right, right. Perfect. I have. I have mentioned also uh, IBCAD in the okay. Question. So in IBCAD, let me just find the IBCAD part. All right. Yes. All right. Good. Yes. So this is the. Uh, oh, I don't have an IBCAD. Okay. So if you go in the IBCAD and if you start the measurement, you can do. Uh, you have the possibility in IDCAD to do two types of, uh, of measurement. You can do a power suite and you can do an impedance suite. When you do a power suite, it means that you can you, you will choose only one impedance and it will do the power suite. But if you choose the impedance suite, then you will be able to choose the pattern, the impedance pattern, where you want to put your, you want to do your uh, suite. And for every impedance, it will generate a power suite. Yeah. So in the in the in, in the in the software, you are able to do that. Uh, let me see if I can open my ID card. I can probably show you. Did, did I understand your question correctly? Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, 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 correct. Okay. Okay. Right. Sorry, I have to. <laughs> Funny, my license of IV card is expired. <laughs> okay. No problem. If it is not working, then uh, still I can. Yeah, because I have to connect to the uh, server at AMCAD, and I think that now there is uh, they, you know, sometimes in the, the weekend they run uh, uh, updates and all that, so we don't have access to the server. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, expect that. Fine. But, Fine. Uh, I can, you know what? I can send you actually the procedure if you want. I can send you the procedure correctly. So please just send me an email so I can have your email address. Yeah, and yeah. I will send you the procedure in IVCAD how to go step by step to do that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm writing my email address. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, and again, in, in IVCAD, you have the capabilities to do. Uh, perfect, I have it. Uh, yes. You have the capabilities to do uh, uh, power suite. Only, so it means you will choose only one impedance, whatever impedance you are at, and you do one power suite, or you can do a, an impedance suite, and this will automatically generate also a power suite. So it will prompt you to, to, to define your pattern, and it will prompt you to define your power uh, suite. So the uh, minimum power, maximum power, and, uh, and also the uh, step. Now, be careful, please, to set the stop conditions correctly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yes. in the first page, you have stop conditions. Usually, we use gamma n higher than one. You stop the you stop the measurements, uh, and the power, for example, a compression power, uh, a gain compression, for example, of four or five dB. Then you stop the uh, depends on the device. Sometimes you can go higher, but usually it's around three, four dB. Compression, you stop the, uh, uh, the you stop the uh, how can I say the, the, the power switch. Fine, fine. And one more question: Is gamma of DUT replace plane low for higher frequency and high for low frequency? Uh, After tuner tuner auto deinventing. Is gamma of DUT reference plane low for high frequency? Is the gamma of DUT reference plane low and half of low frequency? You mean at the tuner reference? Right, right. The, the gamma of the tuner? Yeah, not uh, gamma of tuner, uh, not gamma. Gamma of a DUT reference plane. Yeah, here, right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. Yeah. It, it's all related to the loss, okay? okay? Okay. So a tuner at any frequency, we can ideally, we can put the probe. You remember we said there is a probe here? Yeah. I can put this probe actually touching the, the, the central conductor. Okay? Okay. And that will create a short, right? Okay. But 
because of the loss from uh, from this point, because this is where the probe is, right? Yes. So you have a loss from here to the connector. Right. Then you probably have an adapter. Right. Then you probably have a cable to right. go to the probe tips, right? Right. So even if you have a short here, then because of these losses, the gamma that you will see here is not going to be one because the gamma here is equal to one, ideally, yeah. you know, theoretically. Yeah. But the gamma that you will hear will be 0.9. Okay. Because of the losses from here to there. Okay. Now, as we go higher in frequency, yeah. the losses go higher. Oh. And that's what reduces the gamma here. Right. So for the same tuner, if you go higher in, in, the, in, the, in the frequency, the gamma that you will be reaching at the duty reference plane will automatically be lower. Okay. Back to lower frequency. And this is just because of the loss. So this is just the physics of the things. Because the loss here will be higher at higher frequency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These are the questions from my side. <laughs> I would like okay. to ask the audience again, if you have any questions, you can ask. Oops. So I think no one is responding. So thank you again. So you're now... welcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting <laughs> us. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we can now close this session, and once again we will try to get your <laughs> uh, lecture. <laughs> thank All you. right. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.